series father abraham uh the patriarch of faith and the reason he's called the patriarch of faith is because as i've been saying the new testament writers hold him up as the model of what faith in christ should look like based upon all the way back in genesis the the example of, of abraham and last week was a pivotal chapter that we talked and preached about chapter 15 where it says that that god took abraham, abraham out and had him look at the stars and say count the stars if you can so shall your offspring be and Abram believed God, and that was credited to him as what? Righteousness. That's right. His righteousness was based upon his believing God, taking God at his word, not based upon his good works, not based upon how much money he had, not based upon anything other than the goodness of God. And, and so that was, I just loved that, that sermon. That was more of a theologically based sermon. Today's more of a practical type sermon. You know, and I love, I love preaching both those types of sermons. Because two weeks ago, I, I said something really important, and I want to I reiterate it. Two weeks ago, I, I said that one of the most vulnerable places you can be spiritually is when you're coming off of a spiritual mountaintop experience with God. You know, you go to a men's retreat or a women's retreat, or you go to a couple's retreat, or you go to some seminar, you know, or something, and you come back, you're just really, really pumped for God, right? You have making God all these promises. It's then that you're really vulnerable because you come back to the same problems, you come back to the same issues that you've had before. You come back to the same problems in your marriage, same problems in your finances, same problems at work. And a lot of people, they come off those spiritual mountaintop experiences with a thud, okay? So that's, 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 uh, that is how it can often be. And that's exactly, as we're going to see, that's how it happened with Abram. In chapter 15, Abram has this mountaintop experience. You know, God takes him out and says, you're, you're going to be blessed beyond measure. Count the stars if you can. That's how your offspring is going to be. And Abram believed God, and it was this yay God spiritual mountaintop experience. And then we get to chapter 16, and Abram comes back home to an unbelieving wife, Sarai. She doesn't share the same faith. God hasn't revealed himself to her like he has to God. And so he comes back to her after experiencing this mountaintop experience and she's full of doubt, right? And she's like, I mean, it doesn't say this in the Bible, but she says you're crazy, you know, right? We're like 85 years old, Abram. What are you, what are you thinking that God is going to give us a, a child? Are you nuts? And he started thinking, yeah, maybe you're right. Yeah, maybe, maybe you're right. I am 85 years old. Maybe, maybe you're right, Sarai. And so we get to chapter 16, and he has this coming down off the spiritual top of mountain top experience, and he comes down with a thud. And, it, and he makes the worst mistake of his life. One, that the, the, the consequences of it are still being felt today. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. And so, so let's, read, uh, let's read chapter 16, verses 1 through 18, I believe it is. And this, this is Abram's failure because he was influenced by his unbelieving wife. And it says this. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. But she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar... So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan, Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. Okay, we're getting into some soap opera material here, right? <clears throat> okay, so this is a little messed up. Okay, so when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have, where, where, have you, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. <laughs> Yeah. 
that's almost like one of those cartoon special effects, you know? That was great. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, where was I? Okay. Uh, the angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now pregnant, and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Beer Lahai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and, and Barad. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave him the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. Okay, chapter 15, mountaintop experience, right? Chapter 16, he comes down with a thud, and he listened to his wife. And uh, I, I talked about this, uh, when I think, when I first started this sermon series. Sometimes faith is like a, a, you know, a brand new horse that comes out of its mother's womb and it's on these wobbly legs, you know, and over time it gets stronger and stronger. But sometimes we have setbacks as well, you know, spiritually speaking, and we, we start getting a little wobbly with our faith. Abraham, Abram got wobbly with his faith. Uh, and so today's going to be what, about weak faith, you know, what weak faith looks like. We all have our moments when we have weak faith. And, uh, and so there's, there's four principles that I see in here about weak faith uh, as, as revealed in, in this, this, uh, this story. And here's, here's the first one. Weak faith is short-sighted. Short-sighted. Abram, we're 85 years old. What are you talking about? You're right? What do you mean we're going to have kids? That's crazy. So here, take my, my Egyptian slave, Hagar. You do your thing with her. And he did, and she got pregnant, okay? They were looking at the, the immediate problem at hand and forgot that God is bigger than any problem you might have, right? God is bigger than any problem you might have. And the tendency when we have weak faith is to want to take matters in our own hands. We want to... Uh, we want to usurp God's control in our life. We want, we want to say, God, I can't, I can't believe that. I, I, can't, I can't wait for that, so I'm going to take matters into my own hand. That's what Abram did. And when you do that, you're always, always, always going to settle for second best, right? Um, years ago, I, I worked with this girl named Jennifer, and she was actually a really, really attractive young lady. She was 27, and she'd never been married before, and this was bothering her. She thought by then that she would be married. And so she started dating this guy, and everybody who knew her was like, oh, my word, what are you thinking? You know, why are you, he was from a different, he was Muslim, he's from a different religion. I mean, so completely the wrong for her, you know, and everybody was just like, why is she dating this guy? Then she got engaged to him. And uh, up to that point, I kind of kept my mouth shut, you know, but when she got engaged, one day I was talking to her, and I just felt prompted to say something. And I said, Jennifer, I asked her a question. I said, Jennifer, um, I hear you're engaged. Is he God's best for you? And when I said that, she kind of lurched back. And you could, you could see it written all over her face that she knew the answer, you know. She knew the answer. And in that conversation, she said something to me. She said, Rod, I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of waiting. She was in a moment of weak faith. It was short-sighted. She was looking at the, the current situation. I'm still single and 27. I never thought that would happen, so I've got to take matters into my own hands, right? How many people get into marriages that should have never happened in the first place because they're short-sighted. Fortunately for her, thank God, uh, she came to her senses, and she broke it off. But that's what, that's what weak faith is. It's, it's short-sighted, and we see that with Abram right here. Short-sighted, faith never, faith, strong faith never tries to force God to act. Strong faith never forces God's hand. It waits patiently for God to do his thing. And sometimes it's hard when the, 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 the problems that we face the, the, the money that, you know, that, the, the money problems that we face are bigger than what we think we can handle. But we serve a God who multiplies, right? And so there's a story in John chapter 6 where, you know, Jesus feeds the 5,000, okay? And, and so the, the situation in his hand is there's more people than there's food. Uh, and so his disciples are like, you know, what are we going to do? We have to feed all these people. And this is what Jesus said. He looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him. And he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he had already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than a half year's wage to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. 
Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Because they were looking at the enormity of the situation, forgetting that they were standing in the presence of God who spoke creation into existence, right? He's the God who multiplies. And as we know that story, Jesus had no problem with that small amount, did he? He multiplied the fish. He multiplied the barley loaves because he's the God who multiplies. And sometimes... When, when we're facing hardship, you know, money's tight, relationships are, are struggling with relationships, things are not going well at work, and we, 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 we start to panic, and we want to take matters into our own hands. That's the worst thing we can do because it's short-sighted. Years ago, I was, um, I was on an airplane. It was a beautiful day where I was flying to Alabama. Beautiful day, not a cloud in the sky. And so I was surprised when the pilot came on and said, uh, fasten your, your seatbelts because we're about to hit some bad turbulence. So, you know, we fastened up, and it was the worst turbulence I've ever experienced in my life. I mean, it was like rattling, rattling the plane. Everybody was gasping, you know, your white knuckle type, you know, for about 10 minutes. Was I scared? Yes, I was scared. Was my, my heart racing? Yes, I was, my heart was racing. But not one time in that 10-minute period did I ever question the pilot because I knew that pilot was in control, you know. I knew that he knew what he was doing. I knew that he had been through that a thousand times before. I never questioned the pilot. And we got through it. Sometimes the circumstances of life can be scary, right? Sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, you know, we're, we're rattled by the shaking of life. But there's this wonderful promise that God gives us in Romans 8, 28. It says, and we know that in all things God works for good to those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Isn't that a great promise? So, yes, we're going to, have hardships and, and, and things are going to be tight. But God has promised us that we love him and serve him, that he's going to work all things out for our good. <clears throat> I was 41 when I got married. Joy and I were 41. I, we could never imagine that we'd have to wait that long to get married. You know, but we're blessed today because we waited, waited on God. There's going to be another, uh, I'll, I'll just skip that. I'll skip that scripture. So weak, weak faith is short-sighted. And for Abram, it was very short-sighted. Came off this mountaintop experience with God. He was believing. And then he came home to his unbelieving wife. And that was a problem because, here's the next one, weak faith is influenced by unbelievers. <clears throat> weak faith is influenced by unbelievers. Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be with his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. Like I said, so popper material, Right? Um, back in the 80s, there was this Christian artist named Carmen. Do you remember Carmen? He had, he had this song called the Soap Song. And, and it was a song that mentioned all the soap operas of the day. And it started out like this. Gone are the days of Leave it to Beaver, Matt Dillon, and the sidekick Festus. Now we rely on the immoral lives of those of the young and the restless. <laughs> Isn't that great? This is, like, this is soap opera material. And if I, if I saw, you know, Sarai today, I'd be like, why did you expect that would happen, you know? When you do, when you pull a stunt like this. But, but the, the principle here is that weak faith is influenced by unbelievers. And clearly Sarai did not share the faith of Abram. And that had a negative impact on Abram. And ladies, I'm not knocking women here. God says that God created women to help men. Right, men? Amen to that? Uh, amen. I don't know where I'd be without my wife. But this case, not so much, Right? Not so much. Sarah was kind of a negative influence on Abram, and he listened to her. He listened to her, and it had horrible consequences. This is what, says in, what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 15. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought, and stop sinning, for there are some who are ignorant of God. In other words, stay away from people who are ignorant of God, who have a negative influence on you, because it can lead to bad things. Years ago, I had the best friend in the world. He and I spent practically every day together. And uh, he was a musician like I was. We would lead worship together. When he was 32, he decided to walk away from the faith and got himself in, involved in, um, in a, a lifestyle that was incredibly unhealthy and destructive and ungodly. And, and I was still hanging around with him, and he would try to influence me to, you know, to justify, it came to the point where I thought, man, I love this guy like a brother, but I have to keep my distance because I can feel him pulling me down. 
And that, that's a principle with weak faith is that, that we don't say no to those negative influences. I don't think it's a coincidence that Hagar was an Egyptian. Let's go back to Hagar the slave. I don't think it was a coincidence that Hagar was an Egyptian. Because if you remember in chapter 12, Abr Abram disobeys God and he goes to Egypt, right? And he passes his wife off as his sister and she gets taken into the, the Pharaoh, another soap opera moment. And Pharaoh grabs her as his wife. He, he gives Abram a dowry and makes, makes her, him rich because he thinks this is his sister, only for God to expose the whole scheme and, and Pharaoh kicks Abram out, out, out of Egypt. So I think it's no coincidence that Hagar was the Egyptian because I believe she was one of the gifts that Pharaoh gave him, okay? And instead of giving her up, he held on to her, that remnant of his previous rebellion. He held on. And that's what so many people do. You know, they hold on to a remnants of their past when they should just be letting them go because those, those remnants of their past, those relationships, will pull them down. And one way we allow negative influences in our lives is when we refuse to cut off those influences. And sometimes for the sake of your faith, you have to create a buffer zone with people who have, who have an unhealthy influence on your life. And about this guy, I know a guy named Mark. He, he spent 20 years as a meth addict. And he lost everything. He lost his, his family, his wife, his kids. He went to prison for a year or two. And when he got out of prison... <clears throat> He went right into a residential treatment plan, uh, center, uh, Team Town Challenge over here in Elkhart, uh, which is a Christian-based, and he was there for a year, and he came out clean. He surrendered his life to Christ, and he's been clean for at least 10 years now. And he's a very productive human being right now. And so I was talking to him one day, and he said, when I came out of treatment center, he said, I knew, I knew that I knew that I had to cut off relationships with some of my best friends. So guys who I grew up with, who were my best buddies who I grew up and went to school with because they're the ones who got them involved in the drugs in the first place. And he said, Rod, that was the most painful thing I've ever had to do. He said, I knew I had to do it. I knew I had to do it. And he said, and I, I'm glad I did it because I, I'm keeping that influence away. Sometimes we have to do that. We have to create buffer zones, even with family members, because of their negative influence. In uh, chapter 7 of Romans, Paul has this famous discourse where he talks about the, the law of sin and death that reigns within us. And he says, you know, I, I do the things I don't want to do, and I don't do the things I want to do, okay? And you, you, I think we all can relate to that. And I want to I apply that principle when it comes to um, relationships, because we, we, even though we're spirit-filled Christians, we still retain the sin nature, okay? And sin has a tendency to be attracted to other sin. So that's why we, we struggle, so I, I wanted to have a video, like a visual representation of what that looks like. And I found this video, it's only a minute long, of, uh, of a uh, law of nature when it comes to an apple and a magnet. And so I want to watch, I want you to watch this, like I said, just a minute long, and I'm going to talk about how this looks when it comes to relationships and our faith. So what, what do you know? Apples have iron in them, and so uh, it's drawn to a magnet. So I want, I want to use that as a, as a principle for us because we still retain the sin nature, and that's why sometimes it's hard to do the, the, the right thing because we seem to be drawn, the, the, the sin within us is drawn to that. But what would happen if we had an even stronger magnet on the other side of that apple, pulling it away from that other magnet, you know? That's what the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives is. That's what the role of relationships with other believers is. 
that when we surround ourselves with believers in Christ and, 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 it, and it strengthens us so that we are drawn to that which is holy and away from that which is not, okay? If we don't have that influence, we don't have the Christian relationships, we don't have the church community, and then, then, uh, then uh, and all we're surrounded by is, is un- unbelievers, then we're going to naturally gravitate towards that because of the law of sin and death that's within us. And that's why it's important that we have fellowship and belie- with other believers, uh, a couple weeks ago, I talked about how when Abram came back from conquering the northern kings and he, and he uh, captured or recaptured his, his uh, nephew Lot, and two righteous, two, our two uh, kings came out to meet him. One was a righteous king, one was an ungodly king. And the ungodly king, the king of Sodom, came and he wanted to give him the bounty. He said, yeah, you can keep the bounty. And the king of Sodom said, no, give God the glory. Remember that? Give God the glory. And what did Abram do? He gave God the glory. And I believe it was because of the influence of that Melchizedek. King of Salem. And so, weak faith is influenced by unbelievers. So hold on to relationships that are healthy, not healthy. Buff yourself away from the relationships that are unhealthy. Be wise with who you choose to fellowship or hang out with. I know a number of people who have who've had to distance themselves, including myself, distance themselves from people who have our negative influence because it will pull you down on, 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 your, on your faith. Just like Abram, his unbelieving wife, came up with this hair-brained idea, and he went along with it. So, weak faith. Uh, short-sighted weak faith uh, is influenced by unbelievers. Uh, here's a third one. Uh, weak faith often leads to painful consequences. Amen? <laughs> I think we all could probably, um, probably tell stories of decisions and that you made that, uh, in hindsight, you wish you hadn't uh, because they were made without consulting God. They were made without praying to God. Um, so Sarah said to Abraham, you are responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. <laughs> you're, wait a minute, it was her idea, right? I said, what do you mean? She said, you're responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my slave into your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. And Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. Like I said, if I, went, if I saw Sarai today, I'd be like, what did you think would happen when you come up with a, a harebrained idea like that? You know, it, it, it creates drama, it creates chaos, and that's a, that's a wonderful principle. That when, you, when you walk outside of the the perfect plan of God, it's, it's going to lead to second, third, fourth best. It's, it's, it's going to lead to chaos. It's going to lead to chaos. Um, especially a lot of people have plunged themselves into financial ruin because they didn't want to wait on God. And, then they, and that's what Paul talks about in 1 Timothy 6. He says, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So you can bring on yourself all kinds of grief and hardship uh, because you make decisions that are not based in prayer or based in the Word of God, but uh, they're foolish decisions because you want to get rich now, for example. Um, I, had, uh, I knew a, a couple Years ago, they, they, were involved, they were involved in one of those what I call pyramid, scare, pyramid schemes, <laughs> you know, where you try to get people to buy stuff from you. And the, anyways, uh, so um, the th- thing with those pyramid schemes is that they, you know, the, the company sells you all these uh, how-to manuals and books and tapes that you listen to. Then you got, then you got to go to all these conferences where they pump you up and tell you how much money you can make. And then, and then, uh, and so they were doing all this and putting it all on their credit card. Okay. And so they end up going bankrupt uh, because of all this. And so uh, they started again and did it all again. They had to go bankrupt the second time. What? Because they were trying to get rich, you know? And they're pursuing a, pursuing a, 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 a rich, get, get rich quick scheme. And so uh, weak faith leads to painful consequences uh, in your own personal life, but even worse, it can lead to painful consequences and how it affects other people. You know, our, our, our uh, for instance, our foster system right now is full of children who are the, the victims of their parents, right? Because parents who, 
for whatever reason, uh, are not good parents because of decisions that they have made and how it's affected other people. And, and so we see this with Ishmael. Let's go back to chapter, verses 11 and 12. This is what God says about Ishmael. Uh, for the Lord, he says, you shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. Get this, he'll be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. So sounds like a nice, swell guy, right? Okay, that's what God is saying about this product of the man who should have never been born. And what I want to highlight here is that this is so prophetic. This is such a prophetic verse because I said this at the beginning of this sermon series that there's three Abrahamic religions. There's Christianity, Judaism, and what's the third one? What? Islam. Islam, uh, the Arabs, trace their lineage to, to Ishmael. Isn't that interesting? And so it says, it says, he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone. And everyone's hand will be against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. Does that sound kind of like the Islam today? Isn't that, isn't that interesting? It's, it's, it's like it's prophetic that Ishmael's descendants would take on that nature of, of being violent against other people. And I'm not saying all Arab people. There's wonderful Arab people in the world. Not all of them are like that. But there's a large segment of Islam that's violent. And, 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 and violent towards each other. It's just not outsiders. Violent towards each other. So I, I see that as a very prophetic verse as to what God knew was coming. And so it affects other people. Uh, so, that, um, so that other people are affected. So weak faith does not disqualify us from, from God's promises. But God's promises do not shield us from living with the consequences of our mistakes and poor choices. So that's the third principle. Here's, here's the fourth one. Weak faith mistakes are redeemable. This is the good news. Okay, this is the gospel. Weak faith mistakes are redeemable. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. Does that sound familiar? Because that's the exact same promise that God gave Abram. Isn't that amazing? This, this young man, this boy who should never have been born, who was conceived in, a, in, a, in an unholy alliance, God says, I'm going to bless him. And I'm going to increase his descendants, just like the, the blessing that I gave Abram. What's that tell us about God? That he's in the business of redeeming bad situations. He's in the, he's in the business of restoring broken lives so that even when we make these mistakes there's there's light at the end of the tel tunnel when you're living with the consequences of what you've done so many people have been born illegitimately and have gone on to do wonderful things god has redeemed that life right my grandfather was born my grandfather was born in 1900 he was uh the product i don't know the circumstance but his mother was a 16 year old teenage girl the father was about 20 years older than that. He was in his mid-30s. Um, it was only until recently, the past few years, that we learned about who he was. He was a scoundrel. He was a drunkard. Uh, he was a man who left a number of illegitimate children behind. And from that un unholy alliance came two gospel preachers, my father and myself. Okay? God can redeem the worst of mistakes. He can, he can maybe you had a rotten first marriage, you know? God can, God can bless you in that second marriage if, as long as you align yourself with a, another believer, someone who will build you up instead of tear you down. And so weak faith mistakes are redeemable. And so I love this in, in, in chapter in verses 11 and 12. This is, this, the angel of the Lord says, You are pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. The name Ishmael means God heard. That's what it means. So literally, he says, you shall name him God heard, for the Lord heard of your misery. And then Hagar gave God a name. She says, she gave the name of the Lord who spoke to her. He, she said, you are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. Isn't that beautiful? It doesn't matter how bad a mistake you may have made. It doesn't matter how many regrets you live with. It doesn't matter the consequences that you might have to live with. I believe that God can can show up in that situation and redeem it and bring beauty out of it. He can make beauty from ashes, as it says in Scripture. 
And this is just an example. No, Ishmael should have never been born. Yes, that was a horrible situation that Abram did, but God is in the business of redeeming. And he can take a disability and he can make it an ability, right? He can, he can take your pain and turn it into a plan. He can take your test and turn it into a testimony. He can take your mistake and turn it into a mission. How many people are actively in ministry, ministering to the poor, ministering to drug acts, because that's who they used to be, right? And God gave them a mission, their past mistakes. And so don't let your mistakes, your past mistakes, get you down. We all make them. Look for ways that God can redeem it. Perfect example of that is a guy named John Newton. John Newton wrote the song Amazing Grace, probably the most famous song in, in history. And although he grew up in a Christian home, he, he chose to abandon the faith. He rejected God, and he lived for his own pleasures. And as a young man, he, he strayed as far as, about as far as God, from God as he can, where he uh, was employed on a slave ship, uh, transporting, human, transporting human cargo from Africa. And uh, one day, God got a hold of his heart, and he surrendered his life uh, to God, and, and he went on to become a, a pastor and he wrote that famous song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. And he's, he's speaking from personal experience how wretched he was. And little did Newton realize that someday God would use all those mistakes for his glory to shape him into a, a man who would literally change history. Out of Newton's mistakes, God birthed the most famous song, movie song in the world. You know what? Amazing Grace is the most recorded song in history. Just about every major artist, you know, even today has recorded it. Out of Newton's mistakes, God used his eyewitness testimony of being a slave captain to, to, in testimony. He testified in Parliament to help put an end to the slave trade in Great Britain. Out of Newton's mistakes, millions of lives that have been touched and blessed because God is in the redeeming business. And this is what Newton says. He says, we serve a gracious master who knows how to overrule even our mistakes to his glory and our own advantage. Can I hear an amen on that one? Amen. Can, you te- can you all testify? I'm sure you all can. Testify to the God who takes mistakes, takes ashes, and makes beauty out of them. That's who God is, and that's who God is in this story right here. Abram made this huge mistake, one that we're still, we still, still feel the effects today of. But God is in the redeeming business. So weak faith is short-sighted. Weak faith is influenced by unbelievers. Weak faith leads to painful consequences. But by no means is weak faith unredeemable. It's very, very redeemable. When I was in college, I had this roommate. Uh, His name was Wayne. I think it was my junior year. And uh, one one night, I I was hungry, so I decided to get pizza. And so I ordered a pizza from the local pizza place and and so I'm in my room eating this pizza, and there's more than I could eat. And he walks in, and I said, hey, Wayne, I've got some pizza. Would you like to eat some? And he was like, oh, man. He says, I'm fasting right now. And I thought, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know, I hear him eating pizza in front of this guy, and he's fasting. And then he told me why he's fasting. He said, I, I, I found out that I don't have enough money for second semester for, for tuition. And he, said, if I, he says, if I, uh, if I don't have enough money, I'm going to have to drop out. And he, and he was, he was really, you know, so he's fasting. And the, the next day, we, had, we each had a closet. The next day, he cleaned out his closet and made a little prayer closet. He put, like, this little kneeling bench in there with, with candles. And uh, I'd be in my room, and he'd go into that prayer closet and close the door and spend hours in there praying over that situation, fasting over that situation. The, the enormity of that, uh, that bill that he couldn't pay was, was more than he could handle, but he believed that God was even bigger. And so, so one day, he comes bounding into the, my room, and he said, Rod, you're not going to believe this. But he said, a man in my, back in my church back in Texas, he called me out of the blue and says, I want to pay for your second semester. Isn't that cool? Isn't that a great story? God's in the redeeming business. God is bigger than any situation you can have. God's bigger than any bill you might have. He's, he's bigger than any problem you might face. Instead of trying to make, take matters into your own hands, trust him. As it says in Romans, he, he, he's working out for your good. Just keep loving him and serving him and trusting him. And we know that uh, Abram's descendants, Israel, the Israelites, they, they grew into this big people, group of people. 
And we know their story as we, as we read through Scripture that they rebelled against God. And in their rebellion, they suffered a lot of consequences. A lot of consequences. But God gave them this wonderful promise in Joel 2, verse 25. He says, I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. Isn't that beautiful? I will repay you. I will rebuild you. I will redeem you. No matter what mistake you've made and the consequences you may face, I will redeem it because we serve a God who redeems. And so weak faith, yes, we have our moments where we have weak faith. And, but don't beat yourself up because God's not beating you up, right? Amen. Why don't you pray with me? Why don't you stand up and pray? <laughs> God, thank you for this beautiful story, God, that we can, we can look in Scripture. And that's what I love about Scripture is that it's so honest about the failings of those it, it mentions. And Abram had this enormous failure. And God, we can, we can learn from it. And we can learn what to do and what not to do, God, when our faith seems weak. But God, uh, we thank you, Lord, that you're a God who sustains us, God who empowers us. And God, when we fall, you're the God who picks us back, picks us back up and loves us, brushes us off all, and says, I'm going to redeem that bad situation. We may, not, we may have to live with the consequences of what we did, but in that, Lord, you, we can find hope because you are the God who takes ashes and turns them into beauty. And we love you for that. God, that you have called us to us, called us all to be your own, children of God, heirs of the promise. We love you for that. We say this in your name. Amen.